Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. For those of you who might be first time guests here, my name is Phil Ortigo. I serve as a senior pastor here and it's been my privilege to be here, well, almost 30 years now and it's been a joy shepherding this body and being with you. Uh, I I didn't say that to elicit any kind of response like that. Just wanted to let you know that um, I have been committed to this body, this community, this area for almost 30 years now. And so my heart is deeply rooted in this place. Place because this is our home. Um, just want to give you just a little piece of information. This past Wednesday, I went and had to get a crown, and they put a temporary crown in. And yesterday, while I was eating something soft, the crown came out. And so I had to buy some fix dent and I did the best I could to put it back in. So if I'm preaching and something falls out of my mouth, <laughs> it is the crown. And I will pick it up and put it in my pocket and fix it later, okay? So I'm going to do my best not to get too excited about losing my teeth this morning. <laughs> Well, we're in our second week of a new series that we've called The Elephant in the Room. And the series is focused on looking at some of the hot button issues of our culture. And we're looking at all of these topics, but we clearly want to look at these topics from a biblical worldview. Now, let me just remind us of the ground rules of this whole series. The series is not meant to point out people or failures or criticize people in our culture. The series is not meant to be able to point out certain movements and speak negatively of those issues. The the series is not meant for us to put on our self-righteous robes and feel good about maybe what we believe and where we are. The purpose of this series is to look at these topics from a biblical worldview and to see what God's word says to us, how his word informs us, and how we are to respond to these issues in our culture. Last week, we began by looking at the drift from Judeo-Christian ethics in our culture to a purely secular human view today. In fact, it's moved from a secular humanism to um, programmatic secularism, which means this, every aspect of our culture and education and entertainment and sports is inundated with secular philosophies and secular worldviews. So our point last week is we needed to begin with authority. Because authority always guides us and directs us in what we feel and we think and how we act. And we saw last week that our authority is to be the inspired, the infallible, the inerrant, the absolute objective truth of God's word. And God's word is to be our authority. God's word is to be the filter by which everything in my life and everything in culture gets filtered through. And if what culture says does not line up with the authority of God's word, then it is culture that is off. And so having authority and biblical authority is what we build our lives on. It becomes the bedrock of our convictions and how we live life in this world. And God's word informs us in how we should respond to all the issues that we encounter. We cannot talk about any specific issue apart from resting in the authority of God's word. So we established that last week. Now today, we can start looking at the different topics. And the topic we're going to look at today is race and racism. Because this is something that is in our face every single day. You turn on the news and you hear it. You turn on the radio and you hear it. You listen to it in music. You listen to it in conversations. And there's so much people are talking about race and racism. In fact, it's so much in our view that so many things today are considered to be racist. Let me just give you some illustrations. We have to be careful. Sometimes if you say the wrong thing, you're pegged as a racist. Or maybe if you disagree with someone from another ethnic background, you might be considered a racist. Or if you don't let people work from home, you might be considered a racist. And it even moved from that to inanimate objects. Now we hear that national parks are racist. Mathematics is racist. We're talking about roads and bridges can be racist. And then what happens is we get in a culture where anything can be racist. Now, I'm not using these illustrations to downplay the reality of racism in our culture. 
Racism in the world is a real struggle. It is a real thing, but not everything is racist. And so what I'm not going to do in this message is we're not going to name names of people who have certain philosophies or certain theories. We're not going to look at what culture is telling us that racism is and isn't. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at what God's word has to say from a biblical lens, from a biblical worldview on what is what does God's word tell us about race and racism? And what we're going to discover today are going to be five things. We're going to learn five ways that a biblical worldview explains and undermines racism. That's our goal, is to look at what the word of God has to say to explain it and to undermine racism in our lives, in our church, in our community, and in our culture. And so we're looking at God's word as we look at that. So we have to begin with a good definition. What is a good definition of racism? Let's look at a traditional definition of racism that has stood the test of time. Racism is attributing to one ethnic group intrinsic superiority and valuing it above another, thus treating others as undesirable, inferior, or evil. That's what racism is. It's elevating one ethnic group above another ethnic group and treating them as though they are less than that certain ethnic group. We have seen this through history. Listen, our history of humanity is long plagued with racism. We see it through all the aspects of our culture. It is not just a little problem between black and white and Asian and Rwandans and Jewish people. We see that through the course of history, it is something that has been devastating. It is murderous. It is gross. It is massive. It is bloody. It is destructive. All you have to do is track the history of, of the world. In 1915, over a million Armenians were put to death in the name of ethnic cleansing. And then we see in the 1940s, six million Jews put to death by Nazi Germany, Germany because of ethnic cleansing. And then we can see that in, in, in the early days of, of Japan, they put to death six million Chinese, Indonesians, Koreans, and in Indochina. And we see all the people who were killed. In 1994, hundreds of thousands of people in Rwanda were put to death in the name of ethnic cleansing. And then we look at our own culture. We look at the history of our own nation. And we can see racism, how it's plagued our history itself, whether it's through slavery or the days of Jim Crow or segregation or the wonderful work that Martin Luther King Jr. did through the civil rights movement. And we can see it even today. And we hear it. Sometimes it's silent. It's maybe not vocal, but it is in the hearts of many people. And sometimes it is vocal by mean-spirited things that people are saying or writing on the internet. And sometimes it just comes by labeling. And our history has been wrought with all kinds of labels. I remember an, a, a newspaper article I read once from a, from a, a black man who wrote about a particular label that white people had given to black people in those days. Do you remember the days when people would call black people colored people? Anybody remember that? They were the colored people? Well, he writes this kind of tongue in cheek and it's brilliant in what he says. This is what he writes in his article in a newspaper. He says, white people often refer to black people as colored people, but this label is so wrong. When I was born, I was born black. When I get sick, I am still black. And when I die, I will still be black. But when white people are born, they're pink. When they get sick, they turn green. When they're cold, they turn blue. When they get too much sun, they turn red. And when they die, they turn gray. Here's my question. Who are you calling colored people? <laughs> and I think sometimes we really miss so much of how easy racism can enter into our culture, our conversations, and even our lives. So here's the goal this morning. The goal this morning is not for us to look at what the culture says about it, but what does God's word say about race and racism? 
And what are the five pieces of a biblical worldview that will undermine and explain all the aspects of race and racism? Here's where we're going this morning. We can't land on one verse, one book. We're going to start in Genesis, and we're literally going to end in Revelation. We're not doing all 66 books, but we're going to be from Genesis to Revelation, and we're going to look at what God's Word has to say. Let me tell you something. What I'm about to share with you is where the church needs to stand. What I'm about to share with you is where every believer needs to stand. What I'm about to share with you is the biblical perspective of how we should view race and racism From this point on. Now, I can't cover every single thing about the topic, but there's the biblical lens. So let's put our biblical lens on. Take your Bibles, open to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. We're going to be in Genesis for the first three points, and then the last two points, we're going to be all over the place, okay? So here's what we're going to be focusing on five ways a biblical worldview explains and undermines racism. I wanted to say explains and eradicates it, but we will never be able to eradicate racism fully on this planet. That will not happen until one day in heaven. But we can undermine it by five biblical worldviews. Here's the first thing that we need to understand when it comes to a biblical worldview. Every person is created by God as one race, the human race. We talk about races all the time, but when you go through the book of Genesis, you discover that there was one race that God creates, and it is the human race. Look at verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the uh, the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. When God created Adam and Eve, he created one race. It was a man, it was a woman. They were husband and wife. And in the garden, God created a race, a human race. There were not a series of ethnicities at that point, but there was one race, a man and a woman. Now, here's the wonderful thing that God doesn't tell us. God doesn't tell us how tall they were. God doesn't tell us what shape their bodies were. God doesn't tell us the color of their skin. God doesn't tell us the texture of their hair. He doesn't tell us the color of their eyes. He doesn't tell us any facial features. He doesn't tell us any of those things. He created a man and he created a woman. He created the human race and there is one race. Now, here's the problem. Most of the time, if we're honest, when we read that, we tend to think of Adam and Eve like us, don't we? We think of them like us. Let me just give you a test. How many of you, when you read that story, you think of a a short Asian couple in the garden? No? How many of you think of maybe a a, a couple of um, Eskimos? How many of you think of Native Americans? How many of you think of maybe Africans, black skin? How many of you think of maybe Hispanic? How many of you, when you read that, you think Caucasian, white, blonde, hair, blue eyes? I hope none of you think of Ken and Barbie. That would be another problem, okay? (laughs) That would be a big problem. But the reality is we tend to think in those terms. And the thing is this, that God makes it very clear that there's one race. Listen, we know that not only through scripture, but we know that through DNA. We know that through science. We know that through understanding the genome. We understand through genetics that there's really one human race. You know what we've learned in genetics? You know what we've learned about DNA? That no two people are identical. No two people are identical. But there's so much things that we have in common and so small differences that the human race is a homogeneous species. We are almost exactly alike. There are 32 billion pairs 
uh, of, um, of the genome strand, and of the 32 billion pairs, compared with 46 chromosomes, they discovered that there are only 20 million base pairs difference, which means 0.6%. You know what that means? That means every single ethnic group on this planet is 99.4% the same. 99.4% the same. We're only 0.6 difference. And it's amazing that within those 0.6 differences that we can't get along. We separate from one another. We have wars over that 0.6%. We get divided over the 0.6%. And we forget that we're one human race together. So whenever we look at God's word, he's teaching us very clearly that we're one race race. And we need to remember that. Here's the second thing we need to remember. Not only is every person created as one race, but every person is created by God in his very image. Every single person created in the image of God. Verse 26a and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Every single man, every single woman, every single boy, every single girl on the face of this planet is created in the image of God. Which means that every single human being is an image bearer of God. To be created in the image of God means that we are to have certain communicable attributes that God share, has. We get to share with those attributes. We get to reason. We get to worship. We get to be logical in our process. We can create because God is a creator. We can work because God is a worker. We can love. We can have patience. We can have wisdom. All of those things. And no other creature that God has created can do that except of humans. And that means this. No matter where you go, no matter who you see, no matter what people you meet, every single one without exception has intrinsic, incalculable worth because they're created as an image bearer of Almighty God. The guy that's begging on the street and the homeless person created in the image of God. The missionary that is sharing with people out in the bush created in the image of God. The very people that he's sharing the good news with, created in the image of God. The gangbangers and the police, created in the image of God. The faithful mom and the deadbeat dad, created in the image of God. There's not a person on this planet that is not that. So when we look from a biblical worldview, we see that not only is there one human race, but we see that every person is created in the very image of God. So, if that's the case, what went wrong? Number three, every person is negatively impacted by a sinful nature. When we look at the biblical worldview of humanity, every single human, with the exception of one all through history, is impacted by a sinful nature. We go to Genesis chapter three, and you know what happens there. God tells Adam that he can eat from any tree of the garden, but he can't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then Adam is alone, and then God gives him a helpmate. He gives him Eve. And then they're married, they're husband and wife, living in the garden. And then one day, Eve decides she needs to go do some grocery shopping, you know? And so she going through and, and she comes to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam is with her. He's behind her. Men, he's kind of like what we do when we shop with our wives. They lead the way. We just kind of hang back. We let them pick out what they want. Some of you sit on the benches at the mall and wait for her to spend a fortune before you leave. Well, Eve is out in the front. And what does she do? She takes the fruit because the devil deceives her. He tells her, God didn't really say that, that if you eat it, you will be like God. He is keeping something from you, girl. And so what does she do? She takes and she eats. She gives it to her husband. He eats. She's deceived. Adam disobeys because he was the one who received the command. And the moment that they ate, what happened? They were separated in a number of ways. Here's the first thing that we see. 
And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why did he hide? They knew they sinned. They knew they had offended a holy king. It goes on. But the Lord God called the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree for which I commanded you not to eat? God didn't ask the questions because he needed information. God asked the questions that, that Adam would be honest. And what happened when sin comes? Here's the first thing. There's separation from us and God. When sin comes, there's a separation between humanity and almighty God. And at that point, we are separated. Isaiah 59, 2 says, your sins have made a separation from you and your God, and he has hid his face from you so that he does not hear you. When we sin, the first separation that happens is our relationship with the holy God. But here's the second thing. Sin separates us from one another. It always separates us from one another. Because of sin now, we are separated from one another. We begin to be at odds with one another. Where does this happen? It happens first with husbands and wives. When God confronts Adam and Eve, here's what he says. He says, the man said, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Notice what he did. He blamed two people. He blamed Eve. It was her fault. She's the one that did this to me. And the woman you gave me. God, it's your fault. I was fine with the giraffes. <laughs> but you bring this woman. Man, he threw some shade on her big time. But notice what she says. Then he said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She blamed Satan. And what happens? She put it on him. In other words, she's a victim here. She can't be held responsible for this. This is his fault. Satan made me do it is basically what she said. I read about this man and his wife who got in a big argument because she came home from a department store with a $300 dress. They were on a tight budget, and he said, honey, what, what are you doing? We can't afford this. You got this $300 dress. What happened? She said, honey, I was in the dressing room, and Satan whispered in my ear, and he said, ooh, that looks good on you. <laughs> he said, well, why didn't you say, get thee behind me, Satan? She said, I did. And he said, and? He said, he looks good from back here, too. <laughs> so people have a tendency. That's stupid. I don't know. People have a tendency to blame one another. And so what do we see? Sin has impacted even the relationship between husbands and wives, but it didn't stop there. Then it goes to siblings. Remember Cain and Abel in chapter four? Only a few chapters later, here's what happens between the brothers. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. You know what, they, you know what he killed him over? Worshiping God. God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he didn't accept Cain's. So what happened? There's a jealousy. And what happened? He murdered his brother. And so division between husband and wife, division between siblings, but then it goes on, division within communities. By chapter six of Genesis, the whole world is corrupt. There is absolute chaos and corruption and sin. Here's how... Moses records it. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence and God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, completely corrupt. So what does God do? He brings a devastating flood. He has favor on Noah, his three sons and their wives. And what does he do? He destroys all of humanity. He gives the rainbow as a sign of his covenant but it's also a picture of his judgment because of human pride. And there are some people today who are using that rainbow and calling it pride and not even realizing that that is a very sign of God's judgment on their own lives because they're standing in his face with such pride. And then what happens? He wipes them all out. But then again, humanity comes back. And by the 11th chapter, we see the same thing again. 
rising up in pride. So what does God do in chapter 11? Come, let us go down and let us confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. God took that one race and he divided them into ethnic groups and he moved them all over the world. And ever since then, because of the fall and because of sin, humanity is at war. Our families are at war. Our children are at war. Our communities are at war. Our world is at war because of sin. It is sin that's brought the devastating effects of racism in our world. And because of sinful people and broken people, we act out of the conditions of our heart. And if my heart is conditioned for me to think that I'm more superior to you, then what will ever stop me from rising and expressing that? So, a biblical worldview. Every person's created in one race. Every person's created by God in his very image. Every person is negatively impacted by a sinful nature. If we stop there, it'd be hopeless. But number four, humanity's only hope for complete reconciliation is found in the cross of Jesus. Reconciliation will not be found in policies. It will not be found in philosophy. It will not be found in politics. It will not be found in movements. Reconciliation among ethnic groups and people will only be found in the person of Jesus Christ. And where does it begin? It begins, first of all, us being reconciled to God. In a relationship with Christ, I can be reconciled to a holy God, having been an enemy and that enmity with him, I can now be reconciled. Here's the way that Paul writes it. He says, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. It's in Jesus Christ that we only have hope. It's only in him and through the blood of his cross that we can be restored to a relationship with God. Again, Paul writes in Colossians, he says, and through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus is our only hope. And let me say something. If you're here this morning as a believer, you know the reconciliation that happens between a dead person and one who's made alive and now brought into the presence of a loving God who forgives you, who adopts you, who seals you with his spirit, and you are a new creature. But if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, let me say this. You are your worst enemy. Because the Lord Jesus has your answer and as he stands before you, he says, it is my death on the cross that will reconcile you to me. For you to walk away from this, you are your worst enemy. And I have this for you today. So we're reconciled to God. But let me tell you the second thing that happens. We're reconciled to one another. Here's the beauty of the gospel. The mark that God has reconciled me to him is the fact that I'll be reconciled to you. And a lot of people want to say this. Oh, I'm reconciled to God, but I hate that guy. Or I don't appreciate that group of people. No, that's evidence that something is grossly wrong in your understanding of reconciliation with God. The outflow of my reconciliation with God is going to be I will be reconciled to all people because he has given me that forgiveness he writes in Ephesians, and this is one of the best passages in the New Testament about reconciliation between groups. The Jews who had received the revelation from God, the Gentiles did not. And the Jews and the Gentiles hated each other. And in the temple, there was an illustration of that. The Jews could go to the holy places to worship, but the Gentiles could only go to the court of Gentiles, and they could not come close to God. 
But what did Jesus do? The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, well, without Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel without citizenship. You were strangers of the covenants of promise without covenants, and you had no hope, and without God in the world, you had no confidence. But then he goes on. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. How? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. It's only in a relationship with Jesus Christ that we can even hope to have reconciliation because of all the mess that we've created in this world with one another. And I love the way Paul puts it in Galatians 26 through 28. He says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Listen, not only are we brought together by the blood of Christ, but we are brothers and sisters because we are sons and daughters of God. We are one people. We we are building one foundation, which is being living stones for the glory of Christ. And racism undermines everything that Jesus died to accomplish on the cross. And for us to ever divide ourselves who have experienced the blood of Christ from someone because of their another ethnic background is sinful and is grievous to the Lord. Why? What do you think heaven will look like? In Revelation, we will sing a song to the Lamb. And here's what we will sing. Chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. It says, and they sang, that's us. And we sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Can you imagine what it'll be on that day when we are at the wedding feast of the lamb and countless among countless people who are there at the table because of the blood of Christ eating at this wedding feast and celebration of every language, every tongue, every tribe, every color. And here's the thing that we need to remember that when we come to faith in Christ, we are hidden away with Jesus. My ethnic identity is secondary to my relationship with Christ. And that should be the case for every believer. The issue is not, I'm a white Christian or a black Christian or an Asian Christian or Hispanic Christian. No, I am a fellow joint heir with Jesus, hidden away in Christ, who happens to be of a different ethnic background because of God's grace. We are one. Church, if we are anything but that, we have missed the heart of our Father. And if we're anything but that, we come to assume that Christianity is only for one ethnic group and not the world. And when we miss that, we miss the understanding of a biblical perspective of race and diversity and oneness. But there's one more point. I'm running out of time. Let me get it to you. Every believer is to engage in the ministry of reconciliation. Ah, oh, here's where it gets real. All of this has been accomplished by Christ. This he has left for us. Every believer, every believer is to engage in the ministry of reconciliation. And that means a couple of things. I love the way Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verses 16 through 17. For now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. That means don't pay attention to all the ethnic differences. We can celebrate those things, but those are not the priority. 
Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new is come. Then he keeps going. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. You and I are now called to be the ministers of reconciliation. You and I are ambassadors of Christ for his glory. What does that mean? Let me give you two things real quickly. We are called reconciling the universal church regardless of ethnic identity. I think this is a big struggle in our culture. We are called to the reconciling of the universal church regardless of our ethnic differences. There may be, and there are differences. And we're not saying that they're not. They're cultural differences. They're, they're community differences. They're cuisine differences. There are all kinds of celebration differences. And when it comes to different churches of color, there may be some theological differences. There might be some differences with church polity. There might be some differences and maybe even politics. But what we do is we let all of those things divide us rather than the fact that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And how do we reconcile those things? I met with a black pastor a couple of years ago because my heart was in this. How do, how do we do this in our community? And a lot of times we think that the answer is for us all to have this great diversity in worship services. And while we would love to see that happen, he and I both recognize that, you know, our styles of worship are really different. We drive right past each other's churches to go to another church because we like this style or we like this kind of preaching. He told me this one time. I'll never forget it. He said, young man, I was younger then. He said, young man, he said, if I had your content and you had my voice, we would be unstoppable. <laughs> I thought, yeah. But here's what we agreed on. While we may not be called to worship together on Sundays, we are called to work together in our community. Because what's the greatest picture of reconciliation is when you can see people of different ethnic groups who are brothers and sisters in Christ working together for a common good for the well-being of their community. And one of the things I'm looking forward to is to be able to do more of that as we serve together. And the greatest illustration of tearing down the walls of hostility is when the community sees Churches of colors working together for God's glory. And what they see are brothers and sisters, not division. Here's the second thing. Reconciling the lost regardless of ethnic identity. That means this, that I'm going to share the gospel with people regardless of who they are and where they came from. Here's the test. Our communities are changing drastically. The demographics of our communities are changing wildly. And I was looking at some numbers this week and just looking at the demographics of all the different people groups that are moving into our area is going to be the test because some people will approach it and say, all those people are moving in here. You know what that's going to do? That's going to change our culture. Oh, that's going to change our schools. Oh, that's going to lower my property value. If that's what you're concerned about, you've just indicated what's in your heart. Should we not rather see, wow, look at the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. Look at the opportunity of being a gospel-centered church that's based on the word of God, and we're reaching out to people of all different backgrounds and seeking that through the gospel they reconcile to God and we reconcile with them, and it brings a tremendous testimony to the world of what only the gospel can do. Mark Knoll is a Christian historian, and he has often kind of followed the history of the church and where we've been, and particularly in a book that he wrote called God and Race in Politics. And in this book, he writes these words, which I think are marvelous. He says, God made humans and the creation was good, yet at the same time, humankind has fallen and will never escape the effects of sin here. 
Further, God offers in the work of his son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, the transforming prospect of redemption. Yet redemption never equals perfection. The redeemed must always recognize that their own shortcomings and be filled with gratitude for all the gifts of creation, including other human creatures. Because there's a tension. There's always that tension. That while I know what's right, I know what's in my heart. I know that we desire this, but we will never reach perfection until we get to heaven. So let's be honest with one another. So I've got four statements in closing. Four things to check our hearts. Number one, view all people as image bearers of God. View all people as image bearers of God. Even if you don't like them, they're image bearers of God. Somebody was saying something to me yesterday about an individual, and I stopped them, and I said, yeah, yeah, but they're image bearers of God who need the message of redemption. What would happen if we viewed everybody like that? What would happen if you got on Market Street today and somebody cut you off instead of blowing their horn? Oh, they're image bearers of God. They're defaced. (laughs) They're depraved, but they're image bearers of God. Right? We need to view everyone like that. Here's the second thing. Confess any thoughts of superior status above other ethnic groups. Be honest with God. Confess those to him. Because we can all have those at time, can't we? We can all have prejudice. Prejudice is different than racism. Prejudice is, can be uh, 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 applied to any kind of area of different areas of people's life, but we can be both prejudiced and racist. So we need to check our hearts and say, do I, do I really think I'm any better? I'm nothing. But the grace of God, I can stand redeemed by him and and usher in redemption to others. Here's the third one. Seek to understand the specific struggles with racism experienced by certain ethnic groups. A lot of times we don't take the time to ask questions. We don't understand what other groups might have gone through or are going through right now because we're not in their shoes. And sometimes it's good to sit and just simply ask. My dear friend, John Gordon, who is a member of this church, he was a deacon. We set him apart as a pastor at Scotts Hill. He's been on multiple mission trips with me, moved to Austin, Texas, and he died last December. But John, an African-American friend of mine, who was a, a doctor who grew up with kids that were very affluent, I sat down with him one day and I said, John, tell me, what is it like to be a black man in this culture? I have no idea. I I will not face the same things you face. Tell me what it's like. He said, Phil, let me ask you this. Have you ever had to sit down with your kids and have the talk? I said, you mean the birds and the bees? He said, no, the talk. Here's the talk. Whenever you're stopped by a police officer, turn the keys off. Put the keys on the dash. Put both hands on the steering wheel. And no matter what is said, say, yes, sir. No, sir. Of course, sir. Even though they're driving in their own neighborhood. He said, have you ever had to do that? I said, I haven't. I've never had to do that. And I've never thought of that scenario. And when we sat down and we talked through a number of issues from raising his kids to being in in restaurants and things like that, the things that I began to see that I've never seen before helped me to understand the level of racism that can be expressed unintentionally sometimes and intentionally. And sitting down and getting to know a brother or a sister to help see how I can be sensitive to the needs of people who really struggle with those. Here's the last thing. Love the gospel of Jesus and love all people by sharing the good news. Love the gospel because it is what? The power of God unto salvation. 
to all who believe, to the Jews and to the Gentiles. So this message is the biblical worldview. This message is a cutting message because as I studied it this week, it cut my own heart in the areas and the attitudes that I myself have to die to. So if we're going to be the redeemed people of God, living as ambassadors of Christ, then not only are we reconciled to God, but we seek reconciliation in a way that the world sees the power of the gospel in us. Amen? I haven't heard too many amens. Let me say that one more time. Amen? Amen. Let's live that. I'm going to close in prayer. We don't have any bands coming behind us this morning. But I want to close in prayer this morning and just <clears throat> ask that the Holy Spirit of God would convict us and deal with our own hearts and charge us to be the kind of church. Let me tell you, my passion is that Scotts Hill would be that place. My passion is that we would be that kind of people. I was at the beach this week, yesterday. Anybody went to the beach yesterday? It's crazy hot and crazy crowded. And there were all kinds of people there. And as I'm looking out, having studied this message this week, even in the midst of that, my heart was convicted because of what I wanted to think. And the Holy Spirit took that thought and turned it and said, these are all people I created in my image. They need Jesus. That's what they need. You tell them. You tell them. That's why I have this tattoo, to tell us die. Because people see it at the beach and they say, what, is, what does that mean? I said, I'll tell you if you give me five minutes. I'll tell you the story. It's the last words of the greatest person who ever lived. Give me five minutes and I'll tell you about it. And they say, okay. And I share the gospel. And I forget it's there until people point it out. And I'm going to have to work out a little bit more and walk around like this. So I don't... <laughs> But, but not stupid. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we confess that your word is our authority. And we've heard from your word. And we see clearly. And Father, rather than to get into the weeds and digging into all what culture has to say, and getting bent out of shape with the statements and the comments, Father, would we not be better convicted by what you say and changed by what you tell us? And Father, may we walk according to that. Father, I pray this morning that you would break our hearts where our hearts need to be broken. Father, that you would challenge us to be the men and women of God that you desire us to be. And Father, if we have been redeemed, who are we to shut the doors of heaven and men's faces? Because they don't look like us. Father, may you use us truly as ambassadors and as ministers of reconciliation in all of our relationships. And help us to be sensitive during these times that people would see how deeply you love us as we began this service with. Father, as we leave here, I ask that you would give us opportunities even today to reflect, to put into practice the truth of your word. And I pray in Jesus' name and God's people said,